Hey, hi everyone. This is Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo, and I've got some friends here. And we're gonna demonstrate the use of TRIS for community building. This is a liberating structure. That link is gonna take you to more of a description of it. But I'm just gonna tell you real quick um, that the liberating structures are a set of different ways of organizing conversations with large groups. Can we move on to the next slide? And there's a whole host of them. We've done a few videos of other ones. Um, and they usually take place in small groups in breakout rooms. And so usually people who do them don't record a demo of it. Like you wouldn't find the recording of it, but we're trying to sort of, uh, you know, show what it would like look like in that small room of people, right? Um, and they've been done virtually and they work really, really well virtually with uh, breakout rooms. Um, and then the next slide is gonna just let you know that when you're gonna use something like this, remind people that if the host gets kicked out to just wait and come back in, and the next slide just tells them, you know, when they're in a breakout room, if they find themselves alone, not to panic, to come back to the main room and the host takes care of them. If you have a situation where a lot of your um, participants or students have connectivity issues, just keep the ones with connectivity issues in the main room with you. Um, and also have a lot of people with connectivity issues consider making the groups slightly larger so that no one ends up alone in a room. Something to do two people, make them three or um, if, it's, if it makes sense for the activity, if you won't make a huge disruption to the activity. Um, and so the way TRIZ works, uh, oh, last thing, let students know that they can ask for help if they're in the breakout room, that they can call you to go there. All right, yeah, let's go next. All right, and so the purpose of TRIZ is that it stops counterproductive behaviors to make space for innovation. And it's, it's particularly fun, I think, <laughs> out of all the liberating structures. I think this is one of the most fun. Um, we move on and describe how it works. It's, it's based on a, the TRIZ is like a, it's an acronym of a Russian thing that I am not gonna try to pronounce. I do have friends who can pronounce this, but none of them are here today. Uh, and it's like the theory of solving genius problems, okay? So the, here's how it works. Uh, instead of trying to solve the problem, you create an anti-problem, the opposite of what you want to achieve. And then you ask participants in groups, in small groups, to first think individually and then in pairs or fours. Usually in liberating structures, you do one, two, four, and then you share out. But in online, it's kind of difficult to do that. So either go one pair all or one for all. I usually do one for all. So each person gets time to think on their own and then to share with a group of three other people, so groups of four, and then we share out to the larger group. And basically, they list behaviors to reliably generate the bad outcome of the anti-problem. And then the next step is to identify practices that the people in the group actually do that resemble these practices that they're trying to avoid doing. And then you identify action steps, you know, how would you stop the bad behaviors? And the thing is, um, this tends to make you get more creative and realize things that you wouldn't normally realize if you're trying to solve this in the more positive way that we usually do. Um, and it, and it, it's a little bit fun and funny sometimes um, because if you go really crazy on the second one, you realize that the third, in the third step that you're actually, you are actually doing some of this stuff that you identified as like really bad stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we go to the next slide, so for this conversation, we're going to talk as educators about how would you create, we want to create a great online experience for our students. So our anti goal in the next slide is how can you ensure the worst possible online experience for students? So we can get more specific, but I think we'll stay general for this one. Um, next. So the first thing we're going to ask people to do is alone for two minutes. Um, so I'm asking everyone to do this, alone for two minutes. Make a list of behaviors, practices, or activities which would reliably achieve this anti-goal. So how can you ensure the worst possible online learning experience for students? And so take your notes um, anywhere that's comfortable for you. I'm actually gonna go get uh, a pencil because I don't have one right now. Or you could just actually type them in a Google Doc or something on your own. Eventually, we're gonna start sharing out. So I'll give folks um, maybe just a minute this time just for the video so it's not too long. Um, take a minute to write down some of the things that would make the, you know, an online experience like the worst possible online experience for your students.
usually I, I'm just talking just to explain how I do this activity is that for the alone time, as much as possible, I try to keep people in the main room to ensure that they get the alone time. Because sometimes when you get into groups in the breakout rooms, someone will interrupt their thinking. Or some people might start talking or, you know, some people feel like they finished earlier. Um, so I kind of like keeping that time in the main room when it makes sense. When you guys are done with like a good like three or four things, uh, can you just let me know in the chat that you're ready to move on? Obviously, there's so many things you can do to make a really horrible online experience. So, <laughs> or just look up. Actually, there's just three of us. Four of us. Seven. Wow. This is like a creativity activity. Like, how many things can you come up with in, in like two minutes? Right. Okay. So. Then we would move on to the next slide. So in the next slide, I would normally put people into breakout rooms of uh, four people um, and give them five minutes to go into the breakout room and share their lists together, make a collective list and ask one person to be described. Um, normally, um, Anam, can you click on the Google Doc folder link? So if you have like uh, 30 students, you would have seven groups of around four to five people in them. Oh, you need access? Okay, let me open it from my side. Um, I thought I made, I thought I made it anyone with the link can access. This always happens to me. Like I do something and it looks like anyone with the link can access it. And then when I'm in the middle of a workshop, this happens. And don't worry about it. It's not a problem. It happens to everyone. So stop sharing your screen, Autumn, and I will share mine to open up the folder. And Okay, so here's the folder. I swear it says anyone with the link can edit. See, anyone on the internet with this link can edit. Doesn't it say that? Anyway, maybe I've got the wrong link in there in the first place. You know, this, this is the right folder, but maybe the link in the slides is wrong. And what I would do is I would have, you know, uh, Tris Community Building Group 1, Group 2, Group 3, Group 4. You know, if I had 28 students, there would be seven groups of four, right? And so when students go into a breakout room, it usually tells them, in Zoom at least, it tells them which number their breakout room is, one, two, three, four, whatever. And so they would open the one that's relevant to their group. What I'm gonna do now is, since you guys don't have the link to the, um, to the folder properly, but I would normally give you the link to the folder, right? And in the chat, I'm gonna put the link to this document, which I'm gonna check again for sure, just to be sure. Uh, is shareable. Anyone on the internet with a link. So you should all be able to open this document. And as soon as you do, I'll start seeing the, yeah, koala. Right, okay, so you guys are here. All right, and so what, what I'd be asking students to do is go into this document and start sharing the things that they've been uh, working on individually. They could either type it individually and then start talking or they could just talk about it and one person takes all the notes. Uh, with Google Docs, uh, if there's too many people editing the same document, it can be problematic, but like four people, it shouldn't be a problem. So it's okay if, if they all type at the same time. It's just that you wanna make sure that these are, there are like bullets maybe here so that they don't all write in the same, on the same line and overwrite each other's work. So if you guys want, um, maybe Mia can start here, Rissa can start here, Autumn can start here, and I will also post mine, and, and then just write as many bullets as you need beyond the one that's there. I have a question. What, I'm in the slides, which slide right. are we writing within? 
We're not on a slide. We're on a Google Doc. Okay. I'm so this the, the 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 link that you put into the chat took me to the slides. Yeah. Oh really? Not to yeah. the Google Doc? Oh no. Oh well, this will happen to other people. And I've done this. <laughs> See the the link. So this should it says, be. Maybe there's a link oh. in the slides. No, to the I think you're looking. I looked at the oh. wrong. I was on the wrong side I think you were of the looking chat. At the first Scroll down thing. on the yeah, chat. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You go to the bottom okay. of the chat, not the top of the chat. Okay. Well, I don't know why it was like that. Usually... Mm, I think there are different ways you can set up the chat so that it shows you the latest or the earliest or, you know, maybe if Mia had not been in the chat before today, then she takes her all the way to the top. Everything now that I'm she's having... missed. Okay. I'm... I'm having confusion about where the chat is because all I see is our faces and not. Um... Oh, you, you go to the, the very three bottom. Dots. The very bottom, the, the three, three dots, dots with more. Oh, can you see I, that? I just see yeah. hide self view, stop video. Mm -mm. No, go to the bottom, not the top. Okay. Oh, stop video. Okay, so next to stop video, just keep going. There's participants, there's other stuff, and then more. And uh. then chat is one of those. Can you find it now? It won't let me scroll beyond the options I have, which are stop video, mute audio, unpin video, hide self view. Okay. Let me do but, one thing. Um, I'm going to stop uh -huh. sharing the screen. Now, now can you see that. the chat? Now everything disappeared, but it means there's a window open somewhere where everybody is. So I'll find right. it. You might be, yeah, that might be what it is. You need to alt tab or something. Well, let yeah. me tell you something else. Strange. If you, if we're doing yeah. share screen, wait, if we're mm -hmm. doing share screen, you can see what we're doing, right? So you can just uh, tell us what you wrote and one of us will write it for you. That's the fastest mm -hmm. thing to do. Like in your, if you're in a class yeah. and you're given a five minute time limit, you don't want to spend too much time on the technology. And that's why okay. you, you're going to discuss this stuff anyway. So mm -hmm. it might be helpful to just have someone else do the writing for you. I'm seeing the share screen now. So I'll let you guys write and then okay. I'll well, I can take notes for you, Mia. So tell oh, me what you thanks. would say. Uh, okay, expect understanding of learning infrastructure without walking through it. Okay, what else? Um, deadlines without explanations. Uh, Okay. And then um, skipping over any introductions. Introductions between students, you mean? Yeah. And then I wrote skipping over any time for people to acclimate and get to know each other, which is kind of connected to. So maybe that's all. I wrote one more, but it's kind of a little yeah. connected, but skipping, um, o skipping over any coverage of where to go, what is next, and how to get in touch. So I'll say it again. Skipping over any coverage. Uh, I'm good. Okay, you're good. Thank you. They're, they're actually quite very different things, so I'm surprised that you put them all in one thing, but. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I guess I have like seven, even though I made them four. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so is everyone almost done? Because we're gonna run out of time. Normally I would be keeping time a little bit better than this, but because I'm the facilitator and I'm contributing, it's kind of hard, but it's really important to, to have someone keeping track of time for this. So if I'm the facilitator, I would send out, you know, I have two minutes left, you have one minute left, uh, that kind of thing. There is a way to save time, which is let you type in the first place, uh, but not look at each other's and then just copy it, right? Ask you to just type it in some place and just copy it down. Uh, so that you don't have to spend time typing again, and then you can focus on conversation. But as a facilitator, I would broadcast a message, you know, you have three minutes left, you have one minute left. So mm -hmm. just for now, just like, let's go, you've all heard what Mia was saying. I don't know if you were able to focus while you were, um, while you were also typing your own. Let's see if we have some that are common. And so then we can just remove our names. And I think it, 
we can just remove our names and keep whatever it is that we're doing or we can keep our names like you can ask your students to do any of those things one of the nice things as a facilitator is that you don't need to go to the breakout rooms but you can just look at the different documents and see what the students are doing and you get a sense of who's thinking about what without intervening without you know intruding on their discussion so i like using google docs for that when students are in breakout rooms um, I, it's very interesting that Rissa talked about lack of care and hospitality and compassion, compassion and none of, like, neither you nor me talked about that, Mia. Yeah, but um, in all in honesty... The, in those words. Yeah, I think, I think the, the whole notion of getting started in the right way with acclimation is your first move of care. So yeah. I'm thinking of care when I'm not, but I didn't for... Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, it's, it's about the use of the yeah. words that I yeah. thought was interesting. It is interesting. Time to eye proctored exams, instructor oriented grades, no third spaces. I'm so happy with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, no collab Watch our video about third places that, I, that we have in our uh, community building resources. <laughs> no collaboration possibilities, constant lecture, no group work. So I've got no group work as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this one because Chris already has it. Mm -hmm. All the she has it actually twice. Students are allowed to discuss can be yours, but in a with the agency. No orientation to the course. That's a little bit similar uh, about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, understanding health. And then Autumn has forcing students to do things that they don't or can't feel comfortable turning on cameras. Yeah. Opaque success structures. That's a really good one. Not giving students any tools. And mine are kind of technical, like being fully synchronous or fully asynchronous and not having a combo. I think that is kind of problematic. Um, I think repeating the same thing over and over, problematic, and doing something different every single class is also problematic. Mm -hmm. So the students get dizzy from that, but you don't want them to get bored either. And, and yeah. like having too much to do every single day. So normally I wouldn't, as a facilitator, I wouldn't be here doing this. Did you guys want to comment on anything of each other's? We don't have a lot of time. I'll give you like two minutes to do that. It doesn't really surprise me that neither you or Mia used like language of care because I think when you put yourself in. Um, so notice what Rissa had to do there, right? She had to say lack of care. And I guess with mm -hmm. this um, activity, it kind of puts me in the mindset of trying to come up with the worst thing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of thinking like forcing or um, creating opaque structures. Like I'm thinking more about like those negative words. And so words like mm -hmm. care, words like compassion aren't in my head at an activity like this. Um, I, I, I like what Rissa did there. I like how she was able to bring that in, but that, I think that's why. Uh -huh. Okay. I think is there anything that you feel is missing? Go ahead, Rissa. I think, I think it's a given for y'all that that would be part uh -huh. of it. And uh -huh. for just coming from a STEM background, that is not a given. Ah, uh, yeah. Right. That's a good point. That's a great point. Um, is there anything that you feel like we missed? Because obviously we had just a couple minutes to come up with our own lists. Is there anything now that you've seen these that you feel? I'm quite sure think, we've missed things, but it's hard yeah. in a quick period of time. And I think it's generative of, enough to, to show some things, but I know there are things we've missed. I just mm -hmm. can't think of them. And right the now. value of this is if you have like seven groups of students doing this, between the seven groups, probably most things will come up. And so what you can do with Triz is, I'm, uh, I'm the one sharing the screen, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to where we were, is that we were on, I think I didn't even do this properly. Like, we were supposed to be on step two. Um, oh, we're here, right? So here, step two, for five minutes, we're sharing what's happening in the list. We could either come back to the main room and then think alone about one behavior. No, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Here's something. Oh, I think I'm missing a slide. Okay, I'm just gonna explain this. So the first step is we're supposed to uh, list the behaviors. The second step is to identify current practices which resemble these behaviors, all right? So together, 
and alone first, but then together eventually, we should look at the things that we came up with here and then list the things that actually, even though I say these are bad things, I actually do them sometimes. Um, and so maybe we should all, what I do with this is you can either copy them into and answer the second question, which is here. Is there anything you do which resembles anything from the list? Highlight the above or list them below. It's just easier to highlight from the list. It takes less time. So what we can do is we can take a minute to do that on our own. Just highlight any of the ones that you do. And then after the minute is over, I'm going to tell us to discuss it and then see if there are more. Okay with that? So I'm going to highlight in. You can, I think we can all use the same color. It's not a problem. Am I the only one highlighting? The cool thing about the anonymity is that we don't really, except for me, because I own the document, nobody knows who's saying, who's highlighting what, which, which can be interesting in and of itself. Okay, I think the minute is about to be over. The others have not. I think we need a little bit more. People highlight. One of the things they tell you when you're doing TRIZ um, and doing this step especially is like if you're a team, this is different because we all teach different things and we're not doing the same thing, but if we were teaching the same thing or if we're talking about equity unbound specifically, um, we would, if one person thinks we do it and the others think we don't, we keep it as something that maybe we are doing it because it's possible that one person notices something but the rest of us don't notice, right? So um, so that's an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind here because you might disagree on whether this is the thing that happened. In this particular case, we're each different people. so. I, if I was asking this particular question to students, like how would we get, get you the worst possible course, I think it would maybe for their own experience about how, how would they make their own experience bad in an online course, or they could say which of these bad things they have experienced in online courses at their institution so far, right? So we could do it slightly differently than, than the way we're doing it right now, just to make it more suitable for students. So either change the prompt or change slightly like the agency of who's doing this stuff. And I mean, that depends on your student population too. If you're working with first year students, that might not really work so well, right? They might not have experienced uh, courses in your institution yet, so. Well, and okay. like um, one of the things here is that sometimes you have context for why, for why you answered the way you answered. So, mm -hmm. um, and you can't add to the list. So I'm wondering if that actually, I think there could be some confusion as to whether I should highlight that or not. Do you know what I mean? Like if you, so for instance, on the skipping over any coverage of where to go, my problem isn't mm -hmm. that I don't do it the first time, it's that I don't do it every time. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, yeah. and maybe that's more expecting learning of the understanding of the learning infrastructure because I've walked through it once, you didn't get it, mm -hmm. uh, you should have gotten mm -hmm. it. Um, <laughs> so that's a context-based moment, but it doesn't really fit either of those. And should I have highlighted that? Well, I highlighted it because it was a discussion topic, not because that exactly spoke to what I was saying. Right. I think you said something there that like you can't add to the list. I don't know if you can't, I don't, can't remember if the structure tells you that you can't add to the list. I think you could add a comment or a nuance of what you mean when you say that yeah. like you do it, but not always. So, I mean, to me, like where to go, what is next could be part of that, but that's not necessarily the same yeah. thing because one of them is a structure of the, like the course and the other is just what it's a time thing, right? Right. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Forcing students to do things they can't or don't feel comfortable with. Who highlighted this? One? That was mine, and I highlighted it because I'm not sure I'm doing it or not. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like there are things that I have planned that I think will be wonderful, but there might mm. be um, an invisible discomfort. And I highlighted it because I'm when I think about the, the, the fullness of my own experience as a teacher and as a co-learner, I realize there must be that in, in the context of my, um, you know, that whole history in some form or another. And so I highlight it because it's like this invisible thing that I know exists, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And this is so important because I think when we generate this list, at least when I was generating the list, I was thinking of like, well, because it's posed to you, like, what would you intentionally do that would make something horrible, right? What would make this experience horrible? Mm -hmm. um, but in doing or not doing any of these things, sometimes it's stuff we do intentionally, but I think you're right, Mia. I think there's a lot of power in realizing that sometimes it's stuff that we're doing uh, unintentionally. Or things that just like the environment's dictating. Right. And then there's something, by the way, that some of these bad things go against each other, sort of. They're opposite ends of the spectrum. So, you know, the instructor-oriented grades, it's, it's not obvious, but to me, instructor-oriented grades is on one end of the spectrum and opaque success structures. When you don't do instructor-oriented grades, they tend to be or seem to be opaque to students because they don't understand what it is that's going mm -hmm. on if it's their first time in that kind of situation. So even though you're trying to give them agency, at the same time, this is completely opaque to them because they have no idea what that means or how that will turn out. And they won't get it from the first class or the second week or the fifth week. They will get it sometime maybe towards the big middle of end or end of the semester. I think so. I'd like to weigh in on that because I think I'm mm. um, at, at that, like if there is a kind of like spectrum, I'm definitely in the opaque um, mm. structures mm -hmm. um, like end of the spectrum and I have always struggled with the um, visible not invisible visible anxiety that it produces in mm. my students mm. and mm. I constantly reassure them that it's going to be okay but I'm also mm. aware that my reassurance isn't isn't um, something that they have internalized and they still yeah. go through a form of anxiety yeah, uh, the trust isn't entirely there to, as Maha said, like a serious, a serious, a, a serious amount of time has been and trust has been established. So that's always a risky thing. And sometimes I feel like I kind of move. I just keep going through that um, anxiety that I know is present in some of my students. How am I going to get this grade if she hasn't you know, she keeps saying trust and understand in this like bigger process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can see that the, the, my flipping of the student learning outcome onto them rather than my prescription of it is mm -hmm. something that induces anxiety too. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure what the, what the like resolution there is, but it's mm -hmm. something to think about in terms of bad practices. Mm -hmm. Can we I take one of, last comment? I think we're almost running out of time. So one last comment. Oh, I, I shouldn't comment. But I was I was looking at your forcing students to do things they don't can't can't or don't feel comfortable with. And when I saw the turning on cameras, that's what I assumed it was. So it was very helpful to have that there. But then I thought about if you had not put that there, like the turning mm -hmm. on cameras part, I could t I could basically say my entire class, right? Doing mm -hmm. <laughs> doing chemistry is forcing right. students to do things they don't feel comfortable with. Right. Um so it's like a very again it, it's very contextual and might need some definition and and if that's i don't know whether that's okay and true in wrong theory it is where you can add context to it and say in these specific cases that's fine mm -hmm. or it's not yeah when i highlighted that um i did not ref i was not referring to the turning ca on cameras. cameras um forced turning on cameras it was all the other stuff that i don't know about Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend that we are in the situation where I have to stop you, um, and I I I, rem I don't remember if I talked about this, but in TRIZ, you can either ask students to manage their own time and you know move between steps every five or six minutes, or you can bring them back to the main room, ask all the groups to share out a little bit of what they of what came out in their groups, and then come go back again. 
if you do this talking and bringing them back to the main room and talking between groups a little bit, um, this has the advantage that something interesting that happened in one group could influence another group and that was not in their list and they start adding it. So that is interesting, but, uh, but it takes time that you have to go back and forth between the breakout rooms, but then you also make sure that everyone's at the same step at the same time. Because when you leave students all on their own and you broadcast reminders, they may or may not see the reminders because they're on the Google Doc and they're not seeing the reminder on the on the Zoom, right? So so that's or you just ask someone to be a good timekeeper, you know. So now we're at this last step of what's one action step that you would do to dampen or stop. And so this one again, you think about on your own and then take uh, three to five minutes to talk about what could you do to stop or dampen or reduce the behavior that you identified, like one or two behaviors. What triggers that behavior? What help do you need to stop, dampen, reduce the behavior? Um, I'm going to go back to the document and maybe each one of us, there are four of us, so if each one of us chooses one and takes a minute to explain why they would stop that one or they what they would do differently. Maybe one of the ones that I do that is actually quite maybe easy to fix is the one about expecting understanding of learning infrastructure without walking through it. I always tell students this is how you and in a face environment, 95% uh, of the students figure this whole semester is there will be only one or two students who ever really have a problem with it. And I often tell them, if it's not working for you, but it's working for 15 other students, then ask one of the other students, they'll tell you what to do. I think with a fully online class during a pan pandemic, maybe what I need to do is make space for students to support each other through this. So maybe put them into breakout rooms and the ones who've got everything down can spend the time helping the others in small groups so that it's not me lecturing at them about it and then they, they figure things out for themselves. I'm not sure. Or I take time outside of class time and say those of you who need uh, one, you know, some more support with this, come, come, and come to this extra session in office hours that I'm dedicating to that thing. I don't know. I might do that. What about others? I took on the do too much very last one i think it's under yours uh -huh. yeah um yeah this is one of those ones that i think i think mia was saying that like yeah it's hard because i feel like sometimes i do that sometimes i don't so one of the things that i do if i feel like i'm walking that line is um to actually do a breakdown of everything that i have uh folks doing in the class and think about it from the student perspective and think about how long i think it would take a student to do that particular um do that particular activity and tie a time to it and actually calculate out how much you know time i'm kind of expecting for each one of these and lee graves wolf had a great uh blog post i think about a year ago where she talked about actually doing this and then making it um making it uh for the students so it, making it transparent to the students and telling the students this is um this is how long i'm thinking that you would spend on this activity give me feedback and let me know did it actually take you that long did it take you longer did it take you shorter amount of time and um you know just so that way there's a bit of transparency about the expectations that i have in, as an instructor and how much the reality is that these students and then yes the rice first? yeah the rice course workload i use that too yep yeah. yeah, it's it's very problematic and all the assumptions that are in it but going through the process right. helps me think about um things right. like uh, reading load is not just about the number of pages it's about is this material totally new intellectually to them and are you asking them to write just a summary of it or you ask them to do an analysis of it like how accessible is a reading not just how many pages is the reading and also it assumes an average reading speed 
And of course, not all students read at the same speed, especially in my case where they're non-native speakers. And so this, yeah. this workload calculator, I never actually use it to come up with a number, but it reminds me what questions to ask myself right. as I set the workload, like this, this difficulty one. No new concepts, some new concepts, many new concepts. The page density, people always talk about the number of pages, but the number of pages have different numbers of words. Right. <laughs> you know, my daughter <laughs> reads comic books, you know? That's a lot of pages. She can finish a whole book in a day, you know, in a couple hours. And is it, yeah, how, how deeply do they need to go with it? Anyway, that's, that's a side point, but I think it's going to be useful to people watching the video, so I thought I'd do that. Um, what about Risa and Mia, which of these would they choose? I wanted to make a comment. I didn't do it in the doc yet, but about being fully sync or async. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that like um, balance between the two is something that I feel like I'm still in the midst of refining at the first like iteration of, <laughs> um, in all honesty, um, you know, I think I, uh, weigh in more on the sink. Uh, of course, there's always been activities and networked channels that I use to, um, you know, support the learning, but that's how I've always thought of it as a kind of secondary or, you know, like outside space for the support and that the main event is the synchronous time we have together. So I'm still trying to learn my way through the balance between sync and async. Um, and it's tough as far as I'm concerned. You still do asynchronous stuff with them. It just doesn't replace the face to face. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, but that, that, that's, that's, I think that's okay. I think the problem is when people do the sync and then they disappear on the students. Yeah. I think that you um, jump into all these other third spaces and that's the important part about that async yeah. being like a powerful engine for the overall experience. Marissa has an interesting comment on the margins. <laughs> you know, I've been putting, I saw Mia commenting, so I was like, I should comment too. Um, <laughs> which one, the, the opaque student success yeah. structures or the but if you want to talk about something else, that's fine as well. Oh, no, I, I actually, um, so I tend to make my ungrading very instructor oriented still. Um, mm, really? Graded, yeah, it's really because I'm having. So they're them, giving themselves a grade, but based on criteria that you gave them? Well, they're, they're, they're giving themselves a grade, but there's still, there's still a comparison to the grade I gave them. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's still, I would like to move away from that altogether, like just mm -hmm. like forget that. But I keep it because um, so many of my students give themselves absolutely horrendous grades. Wow. And I'm so much nicer than they are. <laughs> And so I know I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what happens. It so happens. I will have I know, it does. A oh, it, I've had the same experience. Yeah, I'll have a thirty-point spread between the grade they gave themselves and the grade I give them. And so mm -hmm. I would like to move away from that. I just don't understand how, and I can't go to truly self-reflection. Like I can embed mm. self-reflection in the mm. midst of the ungrading to some degree. I can be like, well, okay. Let's um let's get some some justification for why you think you deserve that, and let's do some. Mm -hmm. What was my learning journey during the process of this exam? Like I can do that, but I can't um, totally get away. I can't just do like, hey, so where's your learning journey now? How did this exam help you understand that? Like, I can't make that the grade. I just don't have the ability to do that at the moment. And whether that's me I have thinking ideas it, for you. I yeah, have ideas for you. Um, um, and we can talk about those, but yeah. we need to as Triz and yeah. this conversation. And that's one of the problems is that it truncates conversations. Um, but it just sort of forces you to, so normally we would actually take notes of what we just talked about right now. And we go back to the main room um, and share them out with the teacher, right? So we would have like, uh, like welcome orientation, of course, that's what I would have done. I uh, can't remember what each of you would have done, but we would list those here, right? So that we have a list of four things, the four of us together that we would do, right? 
So if, if we were a team working on one thing, maybe we choose one or two behaviors as a team that we would work on. But I think for this particular one, it made sense that each one of us come up with a different one. Um, so I, I'm actually going to, I think we can continue talking about the ungrading in this video because people who are watching it might want to keep talking about some of the stuff we're talking about. But I'm just, I'm just here to say, you know, what would happen after a while is that we'd come back to the main room and people would just type in the chat some of the things they came up with in their groups. And then the teacher could be able to go, would be able to go back to that document again. They could, you could refer to it in another class later. Uh, you could tell students, oh, these are things you guys came up with. So we're going to try in this class to do this in the future. Or the students themselves can decide to, like, if there are any unproductive behaviors related to their own learning, they can decide not to do it. Obviously, you can do TRIZ with stuff related to the course material itself. So I've done TRIZ with, um, when I was teaching students about privacy, security, and digital well-being, they were reading stuff from the data detox kit. And I put them into groups and I said, you know, what's the kind of behavior that you would do to ensure that you don't have privacy online, that you don't take care of your security online, that you don't take care of your well-being online? And we did TRIZ on that. And then they came up with the behaviors, that the main one or two behaviors that they would do to ensure that they do have privacy, that they do have security, they do have well-being. So this is dangerous ways of doing this activity. Um, now, can I just get a very quick reflection from everyone on how the activity was for you? And then I think we can talk about uh, ungrading a little bit more, I think, because I think maybe people listening might find that interesting. Side benefit, yeah? How did you feel about the process of TRIZ? What did it enable for you? What did it make possible? I, I like TRIZ. I've done TRIZ before. Um, I like the reliably, like how do you get the reliably bad result? That is actually the key piece of TRIZ for me, is that it's not just listing all of the bad things, the bad behaviors or, or things that you could do. It's, it's how to do that reliably every single time. <laughs> It's like precision to the bad moment. <laughs> and so that really is, is uh, I think, the key to TRIZ that's different than like wrong theory, where wrong theory is just about what kind of massive harm can I do? It's not just behaviors that are bad. It's like, how can I like be the worst possible human on the planet um, in, this, in this context? Um, and so I think that is really helpful for me. How would you use it in your chemistry or statistics classes? Triz? <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, well, the whole point of talking about a statistical person. analysis in COVID. How can uh -huh. we possibly, you know what I could do? I just could just show them the Trump video. I'm sorry, I'm talking politics, where he just does okay. the wrong like denominator altogether. And oh. people are like, well, why don't you just use like the total population? And he's like, no, it's out of the cases. And you're like, no, no, <laughs> just no. So I actually have personal examples that we could just. Right. How can, you, like, how can you do the, yeah, that's a great one for statistics, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How can you like, make the most unethical statistics reporting ever? Right. And how do people, I mean, there's so many ex examples of how people are screwing this up right now. Right, uh, the best one, which I always love, is the y-axis, two graphs right by each other where the y-axis are totally different from each other in terms of scale. So it looks like oh, Florida yeah. and like oh, New York yeah. have the same number of cases and they don't at all. I see that all the time, so, all the yeah. time. And there's another one, well, this is not the topic of this conversation at all, but <laughs> there's another one with colors of graphs. Mm -hmm. Where people don't use the same colors for the same meaning oh, yeah, across yeah, yeah. different graphs, and then they're comparing them. I'm like, are you serious? Or when <laughs> yeah. they're doing bar charts that have different hundred percent. Yep. And then they're yep. not really. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. So that's how that. you use it in statistics. That's oh good. yeah. Oh All yeah. Right. Yeah. Pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Mia and Otto. I like this um, exercise because it brings forth form of accountability. I like that we talk about bad behaviors and then we realize that we have proceeded with some of them in like varying degrees, but there's something about the call out and then the sort of reckoning with 
our, you know, what, we, what we've done that I think is really effective. Yeah, I really like that too. And I think especially using it as um, at the beginning of the course to sort of set a tone for the course and get out on the table right from the bat what has been helpful for students and what has been harmful to students in other environments lets me know as an instructor, um, you know, not not just, I, I always struggle with this idea of like good design, right? Because we're dealing with human beings, right? We can, we can design the content in beautiful ways and in organized ways, but if somebody has been traumatized by a structure or by a rule or by a technology in the past, I can try, you know, to say, well, hey, that was your experience, like, maybe just try it this time around, right? Um, but I could also say, you know, maybe it's not that important to this class. And if I know that people have had problems with this in the past and that it's something that has inflicted harm on them, that maybe I can just avoid that. So um, it lets me kind of know where they're at right off the bat. And I, I really appreciate that. How did you feel about these two things? The fact that you think a little bit on your own before you share um, and the time factor where the time was limited. The thinking on your own seemed vital to me. I needed it in order to, to ground myself in the exercise. The time was hard. I thought that it, it came up too fast and it pushed me, you know, before I was ready uh, to complete my reflection. But that's the nature of these things. I suppose you can build in a little bit more time than the, than the allotment we've um, come up with here. But I did experience it as a kind of push, pushing forward when I wasn't completely through thinking all the things I'm learning about. Well, and we accelerated it for the video. It was supposed to be two minutes, and we only did a minute. So I think that for was. Parts, we went more than the five minutes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't following. It's really hard to follow the time when you're also in the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't have my phone to have an alarm. <laughs> so I guess we are teaching them time management, too. <laughs> you know, I, I personally, I, I think we did a good job this time. Um, but I personally, when, when I have that alone time, like I almost would ask like everybody mute your speakers and mute your microphones because when there's other stuff, if there's side chatter or whatever, like I have a really hard time being introspective and like hearing myself when I'm also trying to hear other people. So, um, again, getting back to the fact that like turning off cameras, microphones, speakers can be an affordance of this technology that we should be using more. There's a lot of focus on turning things on, but that turning things off can also be very powerful. Um, I think there's an opportunity there. Another autism. Exactly. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, I didn't need the reflection time because um, I'm an extrovert and could just start talking. Um, but I have found as an extrovert, like Mia was saying, that if I can focus and not, because as extroverts, we'll just talk about stuff and just be like, here's my 12 ideas that are going through my head, as opposed to focusing and saying, okay, here's the stuff that's really relevant to this particular question. Um, but I agreed with Mia that that takes a little bit of extra time to make happen. Okay, do you want to say, say anything else about Tris before I go back to what Rissa was talking about in terms of ungrading? Okay, I just like think it's right really to applicable yeah. to a lot of different contexts, a lot of dis different disciplinary. Tris. Um, yes, I think that it, it can work in many different contexts, and that's one thing that's really strong about this exercise. And it's really okay. helpful when you have. I like what we were talking about in statistics, like when you have lots of examples of how it does harm, like you can think of things mm -hmm. almost immediately, but that also limits what you come up with on your own. So 
you know, when you're doing this, it actually, uh, it can limit it. Not everyone, it doesn't limit it for everyone, but for, it can be limiting to know all of the things that people typically do badly and then uh, not really get out of the box in terms of what that looks like in terms of what you might be doing. Mm, I see what you mean. So when it's something, well, I think it also depends on uh, whether you're talking about students who are new to this. And so they might not, everything, all those things might not be too clear to them or they might not realize exactly what's wrong with it versus mm -hmm. students who are maybe graduate students who do know exactly what's wrong and they already know how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because we came up with a pretty accepted list of bad behaviors. But you think what us if today? there was? I don't actually think so. I mean, a lot of well, the stuff we came up with is just bad pedagogy in general, but not, no, there, it's not even bad pedagogy in general. It's we, the radical, critical pedagogy type digital pedagogues, think this. So a lot of people think that AI and structured exams are fine and that instructional right. integrating is fine and that right. fully asynchronous is great or fully synchronous is the best. And you know, there's a lot of stuff that. But it was radical. It wasn't radical to us, right? No, it was wasn't. radical. It's probably radical to an outside audience, but it wasn't radical to us. We probably mm -hmm. all could have figured out all of those things. What we didn't come up with because we didn't have but, time. Yeah, but there were that things were that others, really out there, right? True, but there were things that you guys came up with that I hadn't written in mine, and I could have forgotten to do them. Like the one I decided to do, which is like orienting students. It keeps coming up in the back of my mind, but I haven't put any space for it into my course. And so this conversation reminded me that I have to do that. And then what Mia was talking about, which is not what I was talking about, but also, you know, this, um, the, the ways in which the ambiguity that we intentionally have in our courses, intending to help them be creative and think out of the box and not limit themselves can provoke anxiety. And I know this. And this is now a pandemic where they're traumatized and they need a little bit more structure and they need a little bit more clarity. And I do not want to add to their anxiety. And even though I want to encourage agency, I need to think about that. So it, I didn't talk about it, but when Mia was talking about it, it's not new. It's just centering this thing that I wasn't centering, that I wasn't, I had not been taking action about and now I'm going to take action. Well, but we also assumed that everyone could get online even in the midst of you having internet connect connectivity problems. We Today. assumed everyone could get online with a device that works and that is reliable um, and that wasn't necessarily mobile. I'm just saying there were yeah. things that we didn't yeah. put down. We didn't, yeah, we didn't talk about one of the things that I, I tell faculty all the time is to have a plan B for students who are having connectivity issues and that that plan B has to be equal in terms of at least learning outcomes for if they're missing synchronous stuff. And so I think it's contextual as well. And I think all of us have in our context, some students who struggle with connectivity. Um, I might actually be in the most, most privileged institution of all of us where I will have maybe one or two students who are struggling with connectivity, but most of mine, for the most part are okay. They might have it, days, like today, I had a couple hour, a couple of minutes where this was happening to me, but most of the time I'm fine. Um, I will have maybe one or two students who have constant problems, but the majority will have to be okay most of the time. Um, but, but I still always tell faculty, you know, try to have alternatives. And we didn't talk about that one. Um, and also, obviously, if you have a majority of students who are like that, then you need to consistently plan for that rather right. than for that being the exception um, so that it doesn't become that these students are always disadvantaged by having a different experience than everyone else in a bad way. Like, I think it's okay for students to have different experiences of an online course because they chose that pathway. But if they don't have a choice, then they're just having a different course, you know, altogether. Right, right. And not to be um, derogatory, we came up with a bang up list for a minute, but I'm just saying, we didn't come up <laughs> with a lot of things that yeah. we yeah. might have. But I think it is different than what other people would come up with. And so if in a larger group, if we had like, 15 more people in this room who went into breakout rooms and came back, we'd have some really interesting differences. And that's why right. it is useful in Trist to bring people back after round one to share, because you'll realize what you might have missed. And if yeah. we used something like Jamboard or Mural where we had a visual thing, 
even though yeah. you were in your group in your corner you could look at what other people were doing without having to come back to the main room if you wanted to see if you missed something so that that would have been another option obviously we could have looked at the google docs of another group i mean there isn't another group but if there was another group we could have looked at their google docs because they would all be open that could be a thing uh, it could be a thing that we decide to revisit next class or the next time we meet or you know rather than while we're brainstorming so that's that's another thing. um can we talk about the ungrading thing can we go back to that sure so so Marissa, obviously you teach um stem things right math statistics and chemistry and there are sometimes right and wrong answers in some of your exams, I assume, right? There are almost always right or wrong answers. <laughs> so, so, and that's why you can't get away from you having input into a number that students see as representing their performance, right? Right. In ways that maybe courses in the humanities and social sciences don't need to have that. Like if you're grading right. student reflections, you could easily just say done, not done, or right. done incomplete, right. not done. Uh, well, and I have binary can, grading for things like that, but they're not exams. Uh -huh. Like you did the homework or you didn't. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like, or you did the learning journals or you didn't. Like there's, there's possibilities, <laughs> but it's not, I can't do that for exams. Um, I could do right. it for some questions, like if you want to discuss why that happened, then yeah, if you put a, mm -hmm. down an answer that makes anything like sense, great, fantastic. If, even if it doesn't make sense, I could just give you a grade, <laughs> right? <laughs> but but um, it's a, a participation grade, basically. But if it's content-based, yeah, there's a right or wrong yeah. answer. Well, I have a question for you because this is one of the things I do when I ungrade with my class is that I ask students at the beginning, what's a grade and what does it mean? And um, almost always they will either say it, my performance according to a standard or my performance in comparison to others. Because obviously some faculty teach, uh, you know, grade by curve and some grade by just uh, cutoff points, right? And we talk about that and we talk about the other option, which is growth which doesn't happen a lot, but you can grade for growth. I'm using the lay people terms because even the proper terms confuse me about these things. But, and, um, and the thing is, each one of these has its own biases, right? Because the one with the uh, curve is just like, for someone to do well, it's a comparison to other students. So you're really put them, putting them in competition with each other so that they shouldn't help each other because if they help each other, they're gonna raise the curve and make it harder for themselves or whatever. Um, and the one with the professor standards looks like it's fair, but it's not equitable because you're the teacher decides what what percentage or weight each thing takes. So I think like, can we give students agency over the weight of their participation grade versus their written grade or their first exam versus their second exam? And some people do that, right? They tell you we'll we'll take the best two out of three exams or we'll weight the best performing exam more than the worst performing exam. So that if you didn't do well at the beginning, but you did well at the end or the opposite, it doesn't, you don't get penalized for that. Um, right. But I also tell them that I use a, I, I think it's good to do a, com, a, a com, combination of all these. Like, mm -hmm. have you improved over the course? And obviously if you started out well, then that's not so important. But if you didn't start out well, but you could do better. And then things like, just to help them think about their own performance. I mean, like think about participation. Right. Yes, you right. came to every class. Do you think that you were participating as well as other people? Are you an introvert or an extrovert? And I, I grade participation of people who are clearly introverts differently than I grade those who are clearly extroverts. Right. But I don't grade them at the end. I'm just telling them that my judgment of you is that, that I understand that it's harder for some people to participate than others. And so I cannot use one single, and that's where the ambiguity comes in, right? Right. But it's not fair not to do that so i'm just trying to you know figure yeah. this out with them and then the yeah. other one according to standards i tell them it's more like if there's a 30 percent assignment that you didn't do then obviously you can't get an a or a b <laughs> but right. but within right. that you know well i i don't I, know if um, that helps no i it's it's what i do i mean we're on the same page in that right so mm -hmm. it's not it's not that I don't do these things. I don't look at, I do grow, look at growth over time. It's just that like Jesse's whole thing where he talks about, um, you know, like you growing compared to where you started. 
not compared uh -huh. to where everyone else started. Yeah. That's something I can't do. Cause I can't, I can't, if you started not knowing any chemistry at all and you came pretty far knowing chemistry, then you might know, you might get a C in my class or even a D because your knowledge of chemistry still isn't what is needed in order to get onto the next class. Yeah, because it's a prerequisite. Do you know what I mean? Right? So, yeah. I mean, it's not really but actually, my standard. But this really is the thing. So you're talking about Jesse Stommel, just in case people don't know. Um, uh, and he teaches humanities. And I think it's really important um, to differentiate. Uh, I think a course that is part of a sequence than one that isn't. But just remember, right. Risa, that when someone gets a C in your course, they are allowed to take the next one. Right. And this has always been a problem for me because this is right. someone who, okay, this is a very important thing with grading, right? When you grade a C, it could be a person where there's two entire learning outcomes that only show up in one of the exams that they didn't right. do well in. But there's an entire learning outcome that they missed. Right. So there might be an entire concept in chemistry that they missed, and that might right. be the most important concept, but it was only right. like 10% of the course. They could actually get a B, and right. they've missed an entire learning outcome because you're not right. grading that they passed every outcome right. most of the time. It's not a mastery-based learning. No. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and, and that is what it is, right? And then you get to the next class, and I'm like, if you didn't master this outcome, guess what? It comes up over and over again. So it's gonna suck. Maybe you they'll get it and master it now. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> just, maybe you'll get it the third time. Maybe it, maybe it'll work. Or so, maybe can you imagine someone graduates? Can you imagine someone graduates with a bachelor's in chemistry and there's an entire important concept they oh we see it all the time reliably kept failing. People at. people have misconceptions when they graduate. They do they do. Um, studies with misconceptions and like one of the big conceptions that happens is that misconceptions is that like reactions require heat like uh, so so when when you're breaking apart things like when you're breaking apart bonds it requires heat to make it happen and when you make bonds it releases heat you ask a, a senior level chemistry person who has just graduated whether uh, what what is going to release heat, bond making or bond breaking, and they will always say, uh, almost across the board, like eighty percent of them say, bond making, because they saw in biology these little cool, like firestorms that come out of breaking bonds, or I uh, wait, not breaking bonds, making bonds. They make you know, so, and then I'm like, why would you ever make a bond if it doesn't make lower energy like anyway that's a hard it's an energy it's one of those concepts that we can say over and over like reliably get the result of they've gone through four years of this and they well, still don't have it well this this reminds me also of eric missouri who did this for chemistry right and he discovered sure. these are Harvard students, and he's a really good teacher who gets really good teaching evaluations. And he discovered the students were missing concepts because the assessments were always problem solving, and they know how to follow right. the steps to solve the problem, but they don't understand the concept. I know for right. sure I'm a computer scientist originally, um, and I had to take four or five physics courses. I had right. no idea. I do really well. I get A's, I don't even A minus. Yeah. I got straight A's in my physics. I understand nothing about physics. Nothing. Right. I just know how to solve the problem when you give it to me in a way that I've seen before. Right. But I don't understand why <laughs> right. it, it works like that. I don't understand right. what's really happening. If you ask me anything about physics now, I have no idea. So this is the other thing is like, what are the assessments? Um, it's focus on problem solving, but not, I mean, it's useful if it's gonna help you solve a real world problem, but it's not useful to help you like develop something new or right or or you know invent well, something new probably and that's my that's my problem with Mazur's way of doing it right so eric Mazur did physics great fantastic love you that's perfect he's big on the clicker system um you give the answer somewhere in there right it's a multiple choice question so the answer is there. You just got to find it. Right, right. And so, but there are concepts, but there are concepts and misconceptions, I think. So their students are more likely to choose a misconception. Yeah. yeah. But, but also, like, 
deconstructing that is actually a really hard thing. So not something we can necessarily do with end grading. But you're right, the authentic projects, we don't get to. Because mm. basically when my students ask me, can I blow something up in this class? I'm like, no, <laughs> you can't. Well, virtual labs. No. <laughs> virtual labs, <laughs> not even in virtually, not even virtually, no. You're not at the level yeah. to blow stuff up. <laughs> Wait until you get to graduate okay. school, then you can maybe blow stuff up in a very controlled environment. <laughs> okay, I think we should stop recording now. Sounds good. <laughs> before we blow up this video. <laughs> nice. Okay, and it asked me if I want to stop the cloud recording.